Well, good morning, Parkview. Welcome to our Sunday online experience. We're so thankful that you have chosen to take the time apart to spend with us. And whether you're watching on a Sunday morning or you're watching Tuesday night, we as a team take time uh, to stop and to pray before we begin and ask that God would take whatever is happening in this room, whatever he is doing um, in this room in this time and actually translate it to you, to exactly what you need, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself today. And in my experience, every time I have ever set aside a time and a place just to be with God, he has met me. He has encouraged me. And that is my prayer and my belief for you right now, wherever you are, that as you take this next hour and you say, God, would you come? Would you meet me right where I am? That he will. All the way through from music um, to sharing what God is doing here in the life of Parkview through Andy's teaching today, we believe uh, that God has an encouragement and a blessing for you today. So would you just take a moment to maybe even open your hands and open your heart and say, God, would you come and meet me as we worship? Amen. storm that surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat yes Lord just one touch and I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do oh just one word you hear what's broken inside me yes you do God just one word and you revive every dream just one touch and I feel the power of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that for greater things, Lord. Yes, we are. Now we'll believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Now we'll believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus now we'll believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise Nothing that our God can do. 
you can do, Lord. And you'll do it again, God. Do it again, Lord.
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. Oh, no, you haven't, Lord. Never have. And you never will, God. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we get to declare that. You've never failed. You never have. You never will, God. And so my prayer is, whatever season we find ourselves in today, whether it's a season of joy and expectation or a season of pain and sorrow, My prayer is you would meet us right where we're at, God, and that we would live in that promise that you've never failed us, that when things are going great, you are with us, and when things are hard, you're with us the same. Thank you, God, for who you are, that you are the God who makes promises and then keeps those promises. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of Jesus who makes all this possible. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Parkview. My name is Nikki, and I am so happy to be here with you this morning. I hope you had a great week. I had a great week. The highlight of my week, I have to say, was worshiping with so many of you Tuesday night at our drive through our drive-in worship night in the church parking lot. It was so fun to see some familiar faces. I even met some new people. It was great to worship with you, to do some holy honking, and just to be together. If you missed it, don't worry. We are planning to have another one in August, so keep your eyes and your ears open for that. I also wanted to let you know that our care and recovery groups are starting to meet here on Monday nights. We at Parkview value recovery and support groups. And we wanted to let you know that we are working hard to make sure that we can provide a place for you to heal and to grow. And so if that is something that um, you feel would benefit you, I encourage you to go to our website, parkview.cc backslash care and recovery and find out more about those groups that are meeting on Monday nights. Before we um, hear from Andy, I would just love to pray with us. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this morning. I thank you that we were able to gather on Tuesday and worship you. I thank you that we are able to gather here on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night and worship you. And Lord, as Andy comes to share your word with us, I pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for what you would have us receive. No matter where we are, Lord, We need your godly wisdom. And so I pray that you would give it to us in abundance this morning. We love you. In your name, amen. Well, good morning, Parkview. Uh, Man, I know it's Sunday, but I'm still thinking about our drive-in worship from from Tuesday night. That was such a great event. It was so good to see everyone. The weather held up for us. It actually ended up not being unbearably hot. And if you had a chance to come, I think you probably would agree that it was just such a highlight of the past few weeks to be together in our parking lot with masks on, you know, socially distanced, but just enjoying each other's company uh, and worshiping together. So it it was just so great to see everyone. And it just reminded me of God's faithfulness to his church over this season. There's been a lot of hard, but there's been a lot of good. And there's been a lot of uh, opportunities to see God's goodness and grace in the midst of, of the pandemic. And Tuesday was certainly one of those things. So thank you for all of you that came and participated. And I also wanna thank you for uh, your ongoing generosity, uh, the way that you continue to give and to be generous towards Parkview that allows us to do things like drive and worship and deliver meals to people that need it and engage with our partners in Zimbabwe and in Chicago and in Villa Park. So thank you for your generosity. And if you are interested in remaining you know, faithful in this season um, to give to Parkview, you can do so through the mail or through uh, online 
online. You'll see the link, you know, on your screen. And we just want to continue to, um, we want to encourage you to continue to be faithful uh, in the ways that you support Parkview because we certainly feel it and we're really encouraged by it. Uh, today we wrap up our series called Ageless. We've been looking at the life and the writings of King Solomon regarded as the wisest person to ever live. And today we address kind of the elephant in the room. You know, whoever, whoever coined that phrase, I think was really had a great sense of humor. Uh, I tried to do some research around where the phrase came from because I just think it's really, really clever, but I wasn't able to really track it down. But this idea that you're sitting in a room or in a field and there's this massive thing that everybody sees, this elephant that everybody knows is there, but you know, everyone's kind of looking at each other to see who's gonna address it, who's going to acknowledge the fact that there's this thing in the room that we all see. And the elephant in the room as it relates to Solomon, is the fact that although he was the wisest person to ever live, although he wrote the Proverbs and wrote Ecclesiastes and is touted as the wisest king in Israel's history, the elephant in the room is the fact that he didn't really end very well. He actually didn't take a lot of his own advice and he made some pretty foolish choices that, that ended uh, kind, of in, kind of in a rough spot for him and the nation of Israel. So we're gonna look at, at that part of Solomon's life uh, this morning and hopefully learn from it. And before we do that, we're gonna look at this parable in Proverbs 7. Uh, a lot of times when we think about a parable, we think about the parables in the New Testament taught by Jesus. It was one of his favorite ways to teach a truth about the kingdom of God or about humanity. He would use these stories to illustrate his point. Uh, but every once in a while, we also see these stories, these parables pop up in the Old Testament. And Proverbs 7 contains one of these parables, one of these stories that Solomon tells. And this morning, instead of having the, the scripture on the screen for you, uh, we're just gonna put the reference at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and if you wanna look it up on your own or go back later or grab your Bible, you're welcome to do that. But I don't know, I kinda wanted today, especially because of the topic, to be a little more casual, a little more conversational. And so I didn't want the barrier of the slides and the screen. So that's why the scripture won't go up there um, and hope you'll humor me. Maybe, maybe you'll uh, look things up later or go get your Bible right now real quick and uh, flip to Proverbs 7 with me. But here's the story in Proverbs 7. And fair warning, it's kind of like a PG-13 story uh, or maybe like PG in the 80s, you know, because sometimes you, you go back and watch some of those old 80s movies and you forget some of the stuff that's in them because they're PG. You know, you think they're safe and they're not. That happened to me a few times on youth retreats and bus rides. Got a little dicey at times. Anyway, so PG, PG-13, parable, okay? Proverbs 7. The narrator says, At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the night set in. Okay, so the narrator sets the stage. There's this, there's this narrator or this man who's kind of sitting up in his, in his loft or in his house and he kind of can see down the hill this scene unfolding and he sees this young man, this youth, this you know, kind of a, a, a synonym for a fool. And he's kind of clueless and he's just wandering down this road and this narrator who can see the whole scene in front of him says, oh man, he's going towards that house her house, that woman that lives in that house, he's, he's gonna walk right by it and he can see the whole thing. And in fact, the, the, the setting starts to take place where he describes that it's twilight and dark is starting to, to set in, you know, kind of a literary clue that, you know, bad things are about to happen, right? Because nothing good happens, you know, after dark. So he's setting up this, this picture that something shady is about to happen and he can see it all about to unfold. So here's the, Here's what happens to this poor youth. <laughs> then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. And now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner, she lurks. I mean, listen to these verbs and these descriptors of this woman. It was really, you, you, you know right from the beginning, this is a shady character. She took hold of him and kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, today I fulfilled my vows and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. 
So I came out to meet you and I looked for you and I have found you and I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let ourselves enjoy with love. She's asking this fool to come into her house and to have sex with her. And then it goes on. My husband is not home. He has been gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. So with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. And all at once he fouled her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing, little knowing it will cost him his life. It's a pretty vivid parable. And you get the picture. I mean, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to kind of see what Solomon is doing. He's setting up this scene, this poor youth, this fool, this, this guy who is just kind of clueless and, and not real wise and intentional with where he's going and what he's doing. He gets caught in this woman's kind of web, this temptation, and again, kind of, kind of dopely, he just wanders into her, her house and has sex with her and succumbs to temptation. And what is kind of the challenge, or maybe a bit of the awkward part of a parable like this, is that although in this scenario, temptation is described as uh, an adulteress, uh, a loose woman, if you will, and the failure, the moral failure is described kind of of the sexual nature. This parable is not about sex or lust. It's a broader parable talking about temptation in general. Uh, talking about this idea of what is foolish and what is wise as it relates to temptation. And what you can see the narrator doing as he sets this picture is basically telling his reader, listen, if you know where temptation lives, then don't go by her house. <laughs> If you know where temptation lives, then, then take another route to avoid the house altogether. Again, it's not about sex or lust, it's about temptation. And if you know where temptation lives and you know the road that gets there, then skip the road altogether. That's the wisest thing that you can do. And I just wanna ask you a question this morning. And I, I, I wanna ask as, as sensitively and as compassionately as I can. And unfortunately, the kind of the, the digital medium doesn't allow for maybe the most pastoral moment. So I, I acknowledge that. But if we were in the room together, I would do my best to, to kind of create a safe place. I would kind of lower my voice. I would sit on a stool, which I'm already doing. And I would kind of just lean in and say, okay, let's just, let's just have a moment here, if you're willing. And I would ask this question. I would say, where does temptation live for you? Not what is temptation, that's a different question. But where does temptation live for you? And what is the road that gets you to temptation's house? And if you're willing this morning, and if you have the space, the, the physical space, literally, I mean, maybe, maybe kids are running around and this is not the best space for you right now. Or if you have the, the emotional or spiritual space, I wonder if you just would humor me and answer the question, where does my temptation live? this morning, because right, we're tempted by a, a lot of different things. And I, I wrote a few, a few of them down, but maybe you're, maybe, and I lump myself into this as well. Maybe, maybe our temptation uh, is to not eat healthy. We have a hard time controlling what we eat. And so potentially maybe the road to that temptation, the way to get there is, is you know, when you go out to eat, you just have a hard time choosing the, the right options uh, or when you have a snack, I mean, you just, you can't portion control. You can't control uh, what you eat. And so the temptation is to not eat healthy, but the road, the path to temptation is maybe a handful of other things. Or maybe your temptation is, you know, you struggle to look at things that you shouldn't look at on, online. If that's the temptation, what's the road that gets you there? I mean, maybe it's too much, you know, independence with your devices and lack of accountability or it's staying up too late. You're the only one awake in the house. And when that happens, you know, you're tempted beyond maybe what you uh, can handle in those moments. That's the road that leads you to temptation. I, I have a few others. Maybe you struggle with, with drinking a little too much. 
That's a real struggle for, for you. Well, maybe the road down to that temptation is the, the Friday night crew that you go out with. And it seems like every Friday night that you go out and hang out with them, you wake up Saturday uh, regretting some of your decisions. Maybe you struggle with losing your temper. That's the kind of the temptation for you. And the road down to that temptation is maybe watching a, a, a certain game or team that you love that just always riles you up when it doesn't go well or watching a certain news channel <laughs> that just gets your blood boiling. Or maybe it's as simple as you not getting enough sleep and you kind of eat up your margin in your days. And so you're just always irritable. And that's the thing that actually leads you towards this temptation of losing your temper. Maybe you struggle with crass language or crass jokes. And the road down to that temptation is uh, going out with that group of guys or girls from your office at lunch. And you, you just have a hard time controlling what you say. Now your temptation is laziness. And so the road for you down toward the house of laziness is when you plop down on the couch, you know that you're gonna have a hard time getting back up. And you're gonna have a hard time doing the things that you need to do that day. Maybe you struggle with, with flirting with someone at your office more than you should and it, it's a temptation for you. And so maybe the road down there is the too many trips towards his or her office. That you know, when you start down that road, that's what's going to come of it because the temptation lives right there. Maybe the last one, I'm trying to paint a broad picture because I don't, sometimes temptation is always just talked about in sexual terms. And so I'm trying to, trying to create a broad picture. Maybe your temptation is spending too much money on things you don't need. And the road that gets you there is just the browsing all the shopping apps that you have on your phone. And it's so easy just to click and it'll be here in 24 hours or 48 hours. And you find yourself tempted to just spend on things that, that are unnecessary. Solomon's point, the, the point of the parable is that if you know where temptation lives, if you know how to get there, then avoid the road altogether. Take a different route. Don't, don't walk by her house. True wisdom isn't just about avoiding temptation. It's about avoiding the road that will get you to temptation. Again, we've talked about this in week one. This isn't necessarily a moral issue or, or an immoral issue about avoiding the road. It's just wise. Avoid the road so that you don't get into a situation that is moral or immoral with your temptations. Look, I think, I think an early no is always easier than a later no. You know what I mean by that? A no to the road, a no to something that, that is earlier and easier is often better than when you're in the moment, when this poor youth is standing at the doorstep of this woman. The no to not go down the road is so much easier than the no not to go into that woman's house. That's what Solomon is trying to communicate. Or maybe to put it another way, a difficult no is better than difficult consequences. Look, temptation is going to provide an opportunity for difficulty. That's, that's true. When temptation comes your way, when, when the things of this world kind of bombard us, it, it's going to create a difficult scenario. So we have a, we have a, we have a choice. Are we, gonna, are we gonna embrace the difficulty on the front end by saying no? Or are we going to open ourselves up to difficulty on the back end by dealing with the consequences of when we didn't say no? If either way, we have a difficult thing ahead of us, saying no or dealing with the consequence. For me, I would much rather... Don't always do it, I'm not perfect, but I would much rather the difficult no than the difficult consequence. The difficult no is temporary, it's in the moment. I wanted that thing and I shouldn't have it, so I won't do it. I should do this, I don't wanna do it, but I should do this, so I will do it. You know, that, that, that difficulty in the moment is relatively temporary, but hard. But a lot of times what we see with when we aren't wise in the way that we act, the consequences are difficult and they could last days or weeks or months. In Solomon's case, literally generations. I'd rather the difficult no than the difficult consequence. Lastly, one more way to kind of put the same truth is that integrity beats out regret every time. 
I mean, very few times can someone come up here and say something like always or never, but I feel really confident in saying integrity always beats out regret. I've never met someone with legitimate regret, real regret at the end of their life. And they said, totally worth it. Would do it again. That's not regret. (laughs) Regret by definition says, I wish I could do that differently. I wish I had a do over. And choosing integrity, which, which is many choices over the course of days, weeks, months, and years. Integrity, doing the right thing, honoring God, being wise will always be preferable than that feeling and that pain of regret. So what's Solomon's foolishness that that ultimately undoes him? And most people will point to the women in his life, the thousand plus sexual partners that Solomon has, 700 wives and 300 concubines. People will say that that, that was his mistake. And what's really interesting about that is you might know this from your reading of the Old Testament, especially there are men in the Old Testament, men of God, men that God uses that have multiple wives. And so the issue isn't necessarily one wife or multiple wives. I know that can be kind of confusing and can raise some eyebrows of why could Abraham have multiple wives and uh, you know, David had multiple wives, but now we're not supposed to. And that's a really confusing question. And I think if, if you're struggling with that question, you should email Ray Kolbacher at ray at parkview.cc. He'll answer, he'll answer those questions for you. And at some point, it'd be great to kind of address some of those hard and odd things that occur in the Bible. But the issue with Solomon actually isn't that he had more than one wife or even 700 wives. The issue is what... Uh, those women and those relationships do to the condition of his heart. That's actually the thing that God is so displeased with and ultimately results in God stripping the kingdom from the house of David or the house of Solomon. So, so this is what happens in 1 Kings 11, okay? This is, the, this is the description of God basically punishing Solomon, okay? It says, King Solomon loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. Got to watch out for those Hittites. Uh, They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He loved them. And he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And his wives led him astray. This This is the problem. And as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Verse 6, so Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David, his father, had done. It goes on to explain that he actually creates altars and places of worship for these false gods. And so in verse 9, the Lord becomes angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. And although he had forbidden, forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. And so eventually, one more verse later, verse 11, the Lord says, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you. Listen, the, the temptation for Solomon was not women. Women was the road to his temptation. The temptation for Solomon was to give his heart away to things other than God, to be distracted by the things of this world, to prioritize comfort and luxury and wealth and women and sex over the one true God. And as king of Israel, his heart, his life needed to be fully devoted to God. And the temptation for him was to divide his heart. And his relationships with these women, his obsession with sex ultimately is the thing that grabs these these chunks of his heart and divides them among gods of other nations. But it's not just the women in Solomon's life. In fact, there are some other red flags that occur in the life of Solomon. 
And other things that lead towards this temptation, other roads that lead towards this temptation of giving away part of your heart. Uh, there are red flags along the way. So, so for instance, in 1 Kings 6, we see that Solomon builds this temple for the Lord and it's magnificent. Many people, it's not around anymore. There are no really ruins of it, but many people say this was probably the most magnificent structure uh, you know, certainly uh, in Solomon's time, maybe top five, top 10 structures ever in the history of the world. He built this magnificent palace, this magnificent temple to the Lord. Extreme wealth, extreme opulence, just lavish. Seven years it took him to build it. Some of you know where this is going. A few verses later, we see that Solomon undertakes his own palace, his own basically temple unto himself. And instead of taking seven years, he takes 13 years to complete his own mansion, his own home. It's a bit of a red flag, right? It's a bit of a red flag that perhaps Solomon is distracted by the things of this world. Perhaps his wealth has grabbed a hold of his heart and has turned him to things other than the one true God. This is his temptation, his, his proclivity to chase after other things, to be distracted by luxury and wealth and comfort and security. What about this? In Deuteronomy 17, we see the description given by God to the nation of Israel of what a king should look like and act like. And here's just a portion of it. It says, the king must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make people return to Egypt to go get more of them. It says, you are not to go back that way again. You must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. We've already seen how this is not the case for Solomon or is the case for Solomon. And he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. This is, this is how a king ought to act. Well, 1 Kings 10, again, these are red flags. 1 Kings 10 kind of gives you a description of Solomon's net worth. And we're gonna blow through some of this because some of these, it, you, just, you just start to realize that, wow, I don't know all the measurements. I don't know all the conversion rates of all these things that you're about to say, but I know I can, I can feel from the text that this is a lot of money, Okay. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents, not even including the revenues from merchants and traders and all of the Arabian kings and the governors. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. And it goes on to talk about more and more gold. Then the king, um, Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in chariot cities, also within Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore trees. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt. It's interesting, based on what we just read from Deuteronomy 17. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150 You read this description of Solomon's net worth, of the things that he's acquired, his chariots, his horses, the fact that he goes to Egypt to get the horses, all of his gold, all of his silver, all of the women. And it's in direct conflict with what God said, this is what's best for you. This is what I expect of my king. And the reason that God has these standards for his king is not because he's out to kill Solomon's joy, but because of exactly what he said, your heart will be led astray by these things. And so Solomon's temptation is, to, is for his heart to be divided, to be, to be you know, broken up into a million pieces, spread across his wealth and his palace and his luxury and his comfort and his security of these horses and of this woman over here and this God over here. And his heart is just shattered into a million pieces, everyone just grabbing a little bit of his heart. And the road that led him down that way was his immense wealth that he never got under control was the women that he loved and his obsession with sex, as you read in Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful book and I believe it's inspired, but you can see from the writing that this guy really enjoys uh, pleasure and gratification. And so that's one of the roads that leads to his heart being separated from God. From building these armies, that's one of the roads, these chariots and horses so that he can defend himself and trust in his own armies. You see these little roads that all are leading towards his ultimate temptation. And to take his own advice, it's so much easier to avoid the road than to avoid the house. 
It's so much easier to say no early on than to say no later on. And a difficult no, a no to things that you might want to do or a no to things that might feel good in the moment could prevent difficult consequences. These are all things that he ignored. Advice that he gives his own people. And in fact, advice that he gives his own son, Rehoboam, that ultimately doesn't listen to his advice either. And so as we close this, this morning, again, I, I wonder if there's just an opportunity to reflect and to ask, are there red flags in my life? Things that if you were to look at, say that doesn't, that's not quite right in your life. If you keep going down that road, you're gonna pass by a temptation and it's gonna be way harder for you to say no later than it would be to say no now. Where does your temptation live? How do you get there? And then how do you avoid that route altogether? Solomon doesn't do it. And so he becomes the, the most foolish, wise person to ever live. And we don't want that for our own lives. We don't want that for our church or our communities. And that's not what God desires for us either. So let's pray together. God, as we reflect on this wisdom over the past five or six weeks, we're grateful for the fact that you want us to live wise lives. And we're grateful for the fact that you care about our choices and want us to avoid difficult consequences. So God, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to look at our red flags, to look at things that might be troublesome, that might divide our hearts and to deal with them and to make the hard decisions and the hard choices on the front end to avoid hard consequences later. And we pray this all in your name. Amen.
to come and do whatever you want to. We open our lives before you. We open our hearts to you. God, we want to be people of integrity. We want to be people who say the hard no, who don't even go down the road to temptation. Father, we thank you that you have promised to be with us, that you have promised that every time to give us a way out, that you have promised to be with us in all things. And so we open our hearts, we open our hands, we open our lives to you and ask you to come. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, Parkview, thank you so much for spending this time with us opening yourself to God to do whatever he wants to do. We hope you have a great week. And before you tune out today, stick around. We've got another awesome Parkview Finds Joy video now. What brings you joy? Serving others, like doing the food drive for uh, our friends in Chicago. It's something that brings them joy every day. It's good to uh, be able to do that and support others that are in need. Hi, Parkview. We're the Rectenwalds in Wheaton. And we've been having fun in our backyard watching Parkview Poolside. Three, two, one.